welcome to September's leaders briefing. Um, there's uh, uh, an awful lot going on at the moment. It feels um, uh, a little bit like we had a lull over the summer, perhaps with COVID retreating a bit and now it's coming back. Um, and some, uh, and I think most of us managed to get some holidays in. Um, but it feels like uh, we really are uh, hotting up and things are ramping up again. So to start with, um, uh, really just a, a, a huge thank you to everybody once again um, for everything that you're doing. We've, uh, we continue to mount a really impressive response to uh, the situation that we find each other, um, find ourselves in. And so, um, so really a huge thank you because it really is the leadership team that is, um, that is making this happen. Um, as I say, there is an absolutely huge amount that's going on. And so uh, in today's briefing, um, I'm really covering a significant number of things. So some of it might be uh, quite a rapid run through. Um, and so do uh, feel free to ask questions or um, uh, approach any other members of the team after the uh, after the meeting. Um, Usual etiquette uh, for everybody. So if everybody keeps on uh, mute, uh, we are recording it so that we can uh, we can send it out to people who uh, aren't able to attend the briefing. If you've got any questions, put them in the chat box. I can't see the chat whilst I'm uh, whilst I'm talking to you, but I'll pick anything up at the end that uh, uh, that uh, that you've asked if it hasn't been answered. Um, and so I'll start on. Uh, so I was going to start off really with the uh, integrated care system. Because uh, we've been we've been hearing this word for uh, this term for quite a while now, which is um, really what the um, STP that we've all been living with for the last three or four years actually is turning into, and it's very much being um, hardwired into the structure of the NHS. There may well be some legislation change that happens between now and the um, uh, between now and uh, April of next year, but the the purpose of it is really what what's the point of it why why is it that uh, the structure of the nhs is changing and moving towards an integrated care system or saying that integrated care is the way that we need to go so um uh, I, on this uh, slide is really sort of you know these are the aims of the ics in hereford and worcestershire and that's um, I mean, it's sort of rather motherhood and apple pie, isn't it? I mean, of course, we all want to improve health outcomes. We want to improve quality. We want to improve the financial sustainability. But you know, what does that what does that really mean? And what does the uh, what does the evidence tell us about that? So I think in terms of us becoming designated an ICS by April, and, and that actually is um, uh, that's the last point. I mean, that's uh, from the from the centre. Uh, all STPs needs to be designated as ICSs by April, and there are some hoops that we need to uh, jump through to get there. But for me, the whole uh, uh, the thing that we stand to gain here is that we've learnt a huge amount through COVID, uh, simplifying bureaucracy, simplifying structures, reducing duplication, and, and we need to build um, on all of that and hardwire in the strengths that we've uh, that we've built on. So what does the evidence tell us around integrated care systems? Well, well, really what it says, and there's been a number of um, uh, really successful ICSs across the world. So there's um, New Zealand, Sweden, uh, Spain, some of the American um, uh, systems. And, uh, and what the evidence is that holistic care, so that if we treat um, individuals around their social, their physical, their mental health needs together, um, that has a much greater impact on uh, outcomes and uh, a healthy population than it all being siloed. And how we engage citizens in self-care and access to high quality primary care um, delivers that improvement in population health management. The other thing the evidence says is that if uh, resources are allocated in a, uh, in a single pot rather than what we've had in the NHS for the last 20 years, um, of a series of fragmented contracts and payments for episodic um, uh, care. Again, that's likely to improve outcomes and, um, and the efficiency of the system. And, uh, and the other part of it is that um, holding provider organisations to so ourselves uh, accountable for the delivery of outcomes rather than uh, the delivery of, the, say, episodic um, uh, care. The other piece of evidence that's, that's clear is that uh, uh, data and the way that uh, data is used to drive what we do, like the priorities we select and the 
and the improvements that we make um, again is is really critical. So uh, that in, increasing that digitization agenda is uh, is is part of the work that we need to do. So um, so that's what the evidence says about it. So in the NHS, what uh, uh, what's the regional steer? What are we being um, uh, told? Well, the first thing that's changed and it's incredibly positive is that um, place and, and really what place really means it's defined by that upper tier local authority. So for us, Herefordshire um, is uh, is the most critical building block in health and care integration. Now, that's something we've believed for a really long time. That's absolutely at the centre of our integrated care strategy. The way that we work with local primary care, the way we work with local mental health and really crucially the way that we work with the local authority. Um, those are the things that will make the difference. And again, absolutely our experience from COVID, the things that we've done together in Herefordshire um, have the things that have, are the things that have been really most effective. So from a regional point of view, um, uh, what they're suggesting is that every place um, so for us, Herefordshire will have a, a single identified place leader working in partnership with other organisations in that uh, in that place. And, and we fully expect, and I've talked about this in the past, that um, that, that comes with a lead provider contract. And the, anti the expectation um, is that uh, Y Valley is the holder of that contract. But holding the contract really isn't the important thing. The really important thing is the way that we work. Uh, with our partners so that we get the best out of um, out of all of the resources that we spend across our across our system. And then at the ICS level, so at the moment at the Hereford and Worcestershire level, there then are a number of things which are um, uh, delivered at that at that scale. Um, and uh, and really that's things like the financial allocation. So working out how much money goes to each place will be things that we'll do across the ICS. Things like um, uh, assurance, some of those assurance of how things are going, looking at things like workforce commissioning and development. It wouldn't make sense to do that um, at a Herefordshire level. It needs to be done on a bigger scale. So the regional steer on ICS development um, uh, is very much in line with the things that we've been saying for some time. And again, particularly, it's important that we get uh, place as the building block. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this uh, on this slide it's a bit it's a bit busy but really it says so if we translate that down into um, an operating model for our ICS for Herefordshire and Worcestershire what will that look like and uh, this is um, pretty much a final draft now we'll be submitting this in November um, for some initial feedback um, to then go through the designation process in February and then be accredited as an ICS in uh, April um, if we are if we are successful. So just a, a, a couple of points uh, to point out here. So um, uh, the ICS Executive Leadership Forum, that really is um, all of the um, organisations, primary care represented, and, uh, and the commissioners in that leadership forum. So that's currently chaired by uh, David Nicholson and would continue to be so, who's obviously the chair of Worcester, but um, as people who know David Nicholson, he used to be chief executive of the NHS. Um, so a really strong and credible uh, leader. It's then the, um, uh, the chair and uh, uh, chief exec or accountable officer for each um, uh, uh, part of the system, so ourselves, Worcester Acute, Worcester Health and Care Trust, the local authorities and then and primary care represented as well. So that's the leadership forum um, and then that's supported by a partnership board which includes um, some more democratically elected um, uh, councillors uh, and uh, people like um, Health Watch and voluntary sector. And then what's really important is this right hand side which is um, the way that we'll be held to account and the way we'll do things will be through um, a, a place based review meeting. So all of our partners in Herefordshire would have a meeting once a month with commissioners where we're held to account for delivering the things that we said that we're going to deliver as a partnership. And as I've talked about before, underneath that, that's our transition board and the clinical um, practitioner forum that sit under that, um, that sit, uh, sorry, alongside the, um, uh, the transition board to um, to really drive forward uh, improvement and the things that we are working on together. So really, that's the strength of the system is it's, it pretty much everything's done at place. There are some programmes of work that will be done um, across the ICS, 
for example, things like uh, digital in, and uh, um, looking at an integrated care and well-being um, record. And then there'll be some forums again across the ICS. So, for example, again, the finance forum, which would be responsible for um, divvying up the uh, money at the beginning of each year. So that's um, uh, the model uh, that we are putting forward uh, across uh, the ICS so we can get designation into uh, uh, for next year. And generally, um, I, it looks slightly busy. I, I think the message in it is, is less busy than the, the, uh, the system that we find ourselves in at the moment and certainly simplifying contracting so that we go to some outcome based contracts with a defined um, uh, value to that and, uh, and a defined population. That's uh, that's is the system that we've been asking for and uh, working uh, towards for some time. So that was a little bit just about the RCS and what's happening with that. It feels a little far away, but it will be um, with us quite quickly and it will change really quite significantly the way that we transact business across um, uh, across uh, uh, everything. The next thing I was going to talk about was um, uh, patient experience, and I think I touched on this a little at our last um, at our last uh, update. We um, uh, we received our most recent patient experience uh, survey, which was uh, um, done at the um, uh, middle of 2019, end of 2019. And uh, I think it's fair to say that it's really quite concerning. So we've pretty much had seven years of this being a flat line. We haven't seen any improvements. And in fact, from 2018 to 2019, we deteriorated. So there's 60 questions about care and treatment in the survey to patients um, and we scored say a little lower than we did in 2018. We have none of those questions are in the top 20 percent of trusts and we've got over half are in the bottom uh, 20 percent of trusts. So that's uh, something for us to all be quite anxious about. So what is it um, uh, what are the sort of things that are being said? And the uh, survey covers uh, pathway, staff, care, hospital environment. Um, and the sort of things that patients and families are saying is that um, I mean, it's not that no one's involved in decisions about their care, treatment and discharge. But if we benchmark ourselves against the rest of the NHS, less of our patients feel that they're really involved in decisions about their care and treatment and discharge than they are elsewhere. Um, they're not always given the information that uh, they need uh, when they go home uh, following their discharge. Really worryingly, more of our patients say that doctors and nurses talk uh, in front of them and don't involve them, talk over them. Um, and more of our patients say they're not treated with dignity and respect. And so this is the national survey, but we've got other surveys um, uh, that have uh, given us a similar result. So uh, it, it's something we've got to work on and uh, the senior uh, nursing team has really been leading the charge on this and after reviewing it what they've decided to do and to lead us all through uh, is that the why value way and the experience of sort of valuing patients time that all of that work the way that um, that program of work really engaged with staff right through the organization uh, and at each team level seemed to make a real difference in the way that we uh, engaged and then were able to make change that stuck it wasn't a top-down change it was it was it was bottom uh, bottom up and using these four questions for patients so you know patients should know when they'll be leaving they need to know what needs to happen before they go um, uh, leave hospital they need to know what's going to happen to them today and tomorrow and they need to know why they're in hospital. So every patient should be able to answer these questions. Um, and if they can't, their family should, should be able to. So this is um, the approach that's being taken and it starts this week. So um, each ward has established the changes it wants to deliver. And the aim is to improve patients knowledge of those four questions and to improve behaviours and attitudes towards patients on the ward. What's going to then happen is there's going to be a survey um, of all patients who are um, discharged this uh, this week. So there's going to be a, a survey goes out to all of those patients to see what their uh, perception was of care. We're then going to follow that with a very regular survey sent to a random selection of discharged patients. And that's going to be done. Um, I say the senior nursing team is leading all of that work and uh, that's ongoing evaluation uh, is going to involve those surveys and also including um, Health Watch, who are also going to be interviewing some of our patients. 
So I think if we get really regular feedback to um, all of our wards and departments um, on how they're doing, that will really help drive the change. Because I think we are at the point now where um, it's, it's, it's not saying that every patient has a bad experience. Of course they don't. The vast majority of our patients have a really good experience, but too many um, don't have as good an experience as they should. It's not consistent enough. And uh, we'll feed back to you as time goes on about how that's going. So a little bit about COVID then. Um, uh, everyone can see the news as well as I can. It's rising nationally. It is rising locally. I've got a little bit of data on that in a moment. Um, we have got some COVID positive inpatients um, at the moment. That's the first time in, uh, in many weeks. So it, it's clear we are at a pivotal uh, point. Uh, the other thing that's um, uh, happened other than the national picture is uh, what's happening in hospitals um, and uh, healthcare premises. So um, uh, across the country, this was from about a week ago, um, uh, this data does change all the time, of course, but from about a week ago, there were 44 outbreaks nationally in acute hospitals and 18 of those are in the Midlands. And some of the themes from that, you know, why, why when those outbreaks are looked at, what, why is it that we've had uh, outbreaks? Uh, it's been around lack of compliance with um, PPE, um, particular issues around um, doctor's mess and lack of social distancing. Staff coming into work when they're unwell, looking at car sharing, um, some leaving and retirement parties um, where there's been a lack of social distancing. Um, and of course, the non-clinical back office staff are just as important as clinical staff. And, uh, and we have had a local outbreak in a, a GP practice, which was uh, related to um, a, a communal area. So, um, so that's clearly a key risk. It's a key risk to us because if staff uh, transmit uh, this the virus to each other we end up with a large number of staff isolating and that really impacts on our on our service delivery so uh, everyone will have seen the new guidance that came out um, uh, it came out nationally and then we've we've put out our local communications um, about that about the use of masks um, in non-clinical communal areas but of course what that doesn't do is uh, is uh, uh, the whole um, uh, it's it's only very much a part of what we're what we need to do we all need to redouble our efforts on compliance with all of the guidelines decontamination decluttering our, our our environments we almost can't do enough on this what we really don't want are any outbreaks amongst uh, our staff that would then impact either on them uh, personally their families uh, or uh, certainly on the way that we deliver uh, we deliver services so um, a, a really big push um, on on that. So where are we in uh, Hereford, Worcestershire at the moment? Um, uh, so we're currently still at level two. Uh, there is a meeting tomorrow that may see us light, rise to level three. Um, Worcester has already gone up to level uh, three since this slide was put uh, put together. So still relatively low levels, but um, uh, uh, this is the slide for Herefordshire right back from March. Um, uh, we can see what happened to uh, us during uh, that peak in March and uh, March and April. This was the uh, Rook Row Farm outbreak that you will have all heard about. And this is the last few weeks where um, we can see that those numbers have started to rise locally. So uh, we're not immune. Um, uh, the levels were lower in Herefordshire than they were in many other parts of the country. Um, and we are lower now than in other parts of the country, but um, it is on the rise here. And so uh, there's all of those actions that are taking place nationally uh, and our local public health uh, uh, teams who are uh, acting on any of those outbreaks as quickly as they can. Uh, again, our teams are very much involved in that, the swabbing teams and our pathology teams who, uh, who are really supporting that effort. So it's on its way back. So winter looks difficult. Um, so we are um, uh, all of the work that's going on around uh, the our recovery plan and increasing uh, elective care, and I'll come to that um, uh, in a little while. Uh, the need to maintain our COVID preparedness and say and deal with the um, higher number of patients, we're starting to see them come back in again. And we have to balance all of that um, uh, with um, uh, the COVID care, the non-COVID care and the elective. So uh, uh, an extraordinarily difficult clinical and management uh, uh, challenge. We've risen to it so far and I'm sure we'll continue to, but that doesn't make it any less difficult. 
Um, uh, the other thing we're doing around winter is uh, really increasing the uh, number of patients who can go through same day emergency care. That's been a program of work that's been going on for some time. And the uh, data from last week was nearly at 40% of our emergency patients um, had had their care within uh, within uh, the same day, which was uh, a really impressive uh, performance, and we'll continue to push that further. Obviously, we've got the capital that came uh, with that that's going to support some changes um, uh, in the uh, at the front of the hospital to make sure that we can uh, we've got the estate to support the clinical service, and then think one 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 program. So um, uh, asking one 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 to direct patients to the right bit of the system. Um, so really ramping that up. We're part of the national pilot on that. Uh, it started uh, in soft launch in uh, in Worcestershire and it comes to us relatively soon. And the other thing is to continue to develop and deliver that discharge to assess approach. I've, um, I've got a slide on that in a moment, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail. And uh, flu and uh, COVID uh, vaccinations, which are uh, absolutely uh, critical uh, this year. Um, uh, it's yeah, it's always important, but even more important that this year that uh, we managed to get all of our um, uh, staff vaccinated. And it's looking uh, possible that there will be a COVID vaccination before Christmas um, available to staff. And so all of that's got to be planned in as well. Um, the COVID vaccination has to be delivered 28 days after the flu vaccination. So it's an important message to get out. So just a little bit about discharge um, uh, uh, pathway, because this is significantly uh, uh, simplified. So and in a way, as uh, uh, this slide formalises uh, what's been happening over the last few months. Uh, so uh, what we saw, of course, was the um, uh, when we went, went into lockdown was that our um, uh, discharge pathways became fully funded. So. Um, no patients are expected to stay in hospital after they're medically fit for discharge. And although the rules have changed slightly, there's a six week uh, cap on that funding. That does give the system time to uh, sort uh, patients' ongoing care needs within that six weeks. And that's uh, uh, really it's the discharge to assess model um, in the way that um, uh, we've always wanted to see it work. So. What we uh, the enhanced integrated care team, which uh, is Lou Bartlett's team, which includes both the hospital social work team as well as our um, complex discharge team, um, they have taken responsibility. So they need a referral for any patient who needs support uh, for their discharge, either pathway one that's into hospital at home or or um, uh, reablement. Um, or into um, a package of care if they uh, if they uh, if the, they're not suitable for reablement. Um, discharge two, um, sorry, uh, pathway two for the discharge process, which is um, uh, Ledbury um, Hillside, which is now nearly full, and our community hospitals. And then uh, for pathway three, for those patients who um, are um, unlikely to benefit from re rehab and are likely to um, stay in a, um, a, a residential home setting, then uh, all of those need to be uh, identified uh, sent to the uh, integrated discharge team and they will get that pathway up and going and should get those patients discharged within uh, within 24 hours onto uh, onto that pathway. It's um, it's a really impressive simplified uh, uh, system and uh, I know Lou would be really keen to get um, clinical team feedback on how that's going for them. Uh, Winter planning flu, I think I've probably covered most of this. Um, it is a peer vaccination programme this year. Um, obviously, we can't do the front door mass vaccination that we've uh, we've done in, in previous years because of the COVID restrictions. Uh, so what's really important is every staff needs to have completed their um, uh, the consent form uh, by the end of the week so that uh, we can make sure that we, we can uh, rattle through um, uh, our uh, vaccinating all of our staff. And uh, we've all got a responsibility to uh, encourage our staff to get uh, uh, to get vaccinated. And I've already mentioned the COVID vaccine, which may be available. Uh, so next then is uh, what's happening around phase three recovery. So this is how we bring back all of our elective services. Uh, again, covered this last month, um, an expectation nationally that we get to somewhere between 90% and 100% of the work that we did last year. Um, we submitted our um, uh, plans on Monday, so really well done for everyone involved in that and a, a huge amount of work. 
Um, and we are a little below the um, national ambition of that 90 to 100 percent, um, but a, a, a really significant amount of work that we're going to be doing. And I'll, and I'll, I'll come to some of the detail in a moment. Um, uh, given that we deliver that plan and that clearly there are some risks because the risks of resurgence of COVID, the risks of flu, the risks of uh, increase in um, emergency winter demand, um, uh, squeezing our bed capacity, all of those are risks. But if we deliver the plan that we've set out, um, that will mean that by the end of the year, we'll have 200 people who've waited uh, a year uh, for their treatment. Uh, but all of those people have decided to defer their treatment. And so anybody who wants to be treated um, should have been treated um, in under a year by the end of um, uh, by the end of April. So submitted the plan, we await some regional feedback uh, and uh, we'll let you know um, if there's any changes to that if we uh, if we need to make any. So uh, how are we doing against the plan that we've set out so far? Uh, so it's slightly busy, but um, uh, the basic message is we're doing pretty well, actually. Um, so this is split into new appointments, follow ups and inpatient and day cases. Uh, the blue line is what we did last year. The red line is our plan and the green line is what we're actually uh, what we're actually delivering. So, as I say, you can see that we're we are planning to deliver slightly less than we delivered last year. And that's just the, the practical reality. Uh, and the green line is how we're doing. So though we were we, we were expecting a pretty big step up uh, in activity in September, um, we have seen that perhaps a week or two later than um, than we wanted to uh, wanted to see it but we're not far away now from uh, the levels of activity that we uh, said that we were going to deliver um uh, and the bottom part of the slide is just percentage wise where where are we against uh, what we were setting out to do and we can see for last week we were you know we're at over 80% of new appoint new appointments, over 100% of our follow-up appointments, and uh, and about 85% of our inpatient in day cases. So a, a massive and really good effort from everybody to uh, achieve those levels. Um, we've still got a lot of uh, uh, virtual clinics, non-face-to-face -face appointments uh, that are going on, much lower in surgery than it is in the medical specialties, which I think we expected. Um, probably just a little bit more for surgery to look at to see if there's more face to face that could be being done. Number of specialties doing really well, but a couple perhaps a little bit below uh, where we, we've expected. So that's some work just to be completed uh, on that. Um, but obviously that does support um, uh, our, our population. And the other thing is, of course, is that with COVID rising again, we may get more patients who, again, are very concerned about uh, leaving home and coming uh, coming into uh, into the hospital. So that again may drive up those non face to face appointments even even further. In terms of diagnostics, there's an incredibly good story here and really well done to the diagnostics team. So uh, again, it's the same uh, uh, set of graphs, which is uh, what we delivered last year and what we're delivering this year. So. Um, across um, uh, MRI, we're um, pretty much back to where we were, and in um, uh, uh, non-obstetric ultrasound and CT, we're actually delivering more than we did last year, which is which is pretty extraordinary and, uh, and really well done. And what that means is for our patients waiting over six weeks, um, people remember this this was a national target, and we always delivered really well on this that we we maintained less than one percent of our our patients waiting over six weeks. Those uh, ramped up pretty quickly uh, over the uh, over the period of lockdown, but they've come down really quickly. So, um, uh, uh, so really good uh, news in diagnostics, and obviously that helps all of our other services as well. Uh, endoscopy, um, similar uh, picture to the elective uh, uh, services, uh, a little behind um, uh, where we wanted to be at this time, uh, but there's still an awful lot of work that's going on there to increase that. And I think we're pretty confident that we're going to get there with the endoscopy. Uh, endoscopy. And so what does that mean for our patients and how long they are waiting? Well, as I say, we, we've, we, we've, we've had this um, a huge increase, as has the rest of the country, in patients waiting over, uh, over a year for their treatment. Uh, we're we're at around 700 now across the uh, across the organisation, but as I say the expectation if we deliver our plans, we'll be down to 200 by the end of the year, and those will be people who have deferred. 
What's really good news is that in terms of numbers of patients waiting over 18 weeks, um, we do seem to have turned a corner on that and, uh, and we have reduced the number of patients who are waiting over 18 weeks. So um, uh, as those services have come back in, uh, it, it's it, it's really stopped the rot and, uh, and uh, our, our uh, population will be uh, very grateful for that. So next on to the uh, financial plan, it's um, it's uh, an interesting picture. What we had from months one to six was broadly what we spent um, uh, was we were reimbursed to the level that we spent. Things have tightened significantly for the second half of the year. Uh, so we have uh, each system, so that's at the ICS level, so at Hereford and Worcestershire level, um, has received a funding envelope that happened about a week ago it had been um uh, we've been waiting for some weeks for that to come and i think it's uh, uh reasonable to say at this stage that nhse and nhsi view those envelopes as workable and sufficient to deliver the phase three activity i'll come on to um uh the fact that we really don't agree at the moment and i have to say we're not alone in that um, there is an expectation that within that um, uh, ICS STP envelope that providers and CCGs must achieve financial balance. That's the expectation. And those um, uh, system top ups and uh, uh, will again will be distributed to the lead CCG. So I mean, we only have one CCG uh, uh, now, as will most um, uh, STPs, ICSs before very long. And um, and so that um, uh, national um, retrospective top up um, directly to us um, uh, will stop in the in the next week. So the finance team have looked at this and um, and uh, assuming um, uh, and uh, the national plan does assume that we recover all of our um, uh, non NHS income to the level that we did last year, which is quite a big assumption. And um, uh, we have included all of our into all of our figures that those recovery commitments. So that uh, phased plan that I've just gone through, all of that is uh, funded within uh, the figures that we've put together, and it assumes that we are funded for our COVID nineteen expense expenditure, which is um, uh, say in that national top up, which comes to the uh, comes to the lead CCG. We put all of that together. Uh, the NHSE and I. Um, expectation is that we would have a deficit of um, around about 19 million, of which they were going to top up the uh, STP to the level of 17 million. So that still left us a couple of million short. Um, uh, but unfortunately, the work that's been done on costing our plan means that we're likely to be um, a much nearer 30 million deficit, um, uh, given everything uh, that we know. As I say, we're not alone in that. Um, uh, I think every trust has uh, has felt that the amount of money uh, that's been uh, put together and has been put into those envelopes isn't going to be enough to deliver the expectation. Um, so all of that feedback is going back uh, at the moment, um, and uh, we will submit our own plan uh, at the end of uh, at the end of October. However, given that. Uh, we still need to agree budgets for all of you um, budget holders and uh, different services um, for the last six months of the year and so that will come through to you but our assumption is that we will deliver our recovery activity uh, our activity plan um, uh, no one anywhere in the service is saying that um, that we should reduce the amount of activity we're doing to meet the financial uh, envelope um, although that is the expectation so uh, there's quite some difficult conversations Conversations to have, and we'll let you know. But I think the, the big message really is you will have a budget and it should be enough to deliver the uh, recovery plan that you've put together. Uh, just a little bit about uh, health and wellbeing. Um, for all of us, um, we need to uh, make sure that we look after ourselves. As I say we had uh, a bit of a lull during the uh, summer um, uh, period, and I say I think most of us managed to get some, uh, some time off. Um, uh, but the things are hotting up. It's going to be a difficult winter. Um, and so um, uh, 
uh, Jeffrey Atule and his uh, his uh, team and working with staff side uh, are looking about all the things that we need to do. And there's a health and wellbeing week um, coming on the 19th to 23rd of October, the whole range of things that uh, that we're going to be uh, doing that. So please look out for all of that and encourage your staff to be involved in that and to make sure that they know um, uh, they know certainly the services that they can access to uh, support their own health and wellbeing. Um, uh, last slide before I go to some uh, uh, questions. So just a few new appointments just to tell you about some new roles. So firstly, um, uh, a welcome to Linda Dykes, who's joined us from uh, Wales um, as our, our Associate Medical Director for Integrated Care, uh, who uh, completes that AMD um, uh, team working with David. Uh, she's uh, uh, got an unusual and interesting CV. She's uh, both a qualified uh, GP and um, uh, in, uh, ED consultant and will be working in ED for some time and be, will be working um, across the uh, integrated and primary care uh, um, uh, divide um, uh, for the rest of her time, interface rather than divide, uh, for the rest, uh, rest of her time. So it's a really, really strong addition to our team. So a real welcome to, uh, welcome to Linda. Um, our divisional operation directors have moved into associate chief operating officer uh, roles, but they're the same for um, uh, really strong leaders that we uh, we've had for some time. And uh, lastly, a welcome to Chris Wood. We haven't uh, got his starting date yet, but he's been uh, uh, poached from uh, Health Education England to be our head of education. Again, is a really um, strong addition to our team and will really support us. Uh, both with our educational programmes, uh, but also in accessing the resources that HEE -E hold. 